Hello and welcome to QTV and the Audio Engineering Society Christmas Lecture. This is kindly supported by BT Media and Broadcast. I'm Gareth Gordon, Chief Technology Officer here at QTV. I graduated with a degree in Audio Engineering and Electronics from Glasgow Caledonia University in 2000 and began a traineeship at BBC Scotland as a Vision Engineer in 2003. I went freelance in 2014 and joined QTV to assist in the design and implementation of their new remote operations project in 2020. I'm Julie Robinson, Senior Broadcast Manager at QTV. I graduated with a degree in electronics with music from the University of Glasgow in 2000. I began my traineeship at BBC Scotland, also as a vision engineer, later that year. I went freelance in 2021 and joined QTV a few months later to help with the operational running of the new remote production galleries and outside broadcast vehicles. So, we both graduate, we've both started out as postgraduate audio engineers with aspirations of working independently found ourselves working together at the BBC as vision engineers. That role re requires being responsible for the distribution of video signals and viewing equipment, as well as operating racks, the remote control panels used to match the colour and levels between cameras. Now, although these two departments, sound and vision, may initially seem very different, they share many qualities in broadcast engineering terms. They are both waves on the electromagnetic spectrum, one ending in kilohertz and the other starting in megahertz. And both have to be acquired or ingested, converted to electrical signals and then converted again from analogue to digital. Although sound and vision are processed separately, they frequently share the same signal path and are eventually combined into the final output that you view at home. As engineers, our job is to arrange and manage these signal paths, work with data streams, problem solve the routes, and often be creative about how they get to where they need to be all at the same time. For Gareth and me, our career paths moving from an audio background into vision, then leading us both here to the remote production control rooms at QTV, are a very relevant parallel, parallel for what we would like to talk to you about today. We're going to explain how Gareth has been finding new and streamlined methods of keeping the company competitive, utilising interestingly combined audio and vision workflows. But first, you might be wondering what we do here at QTV. Jack McGill and Mike Stanger started the company in 2011. They were pioneers in the field of live streaming and were particularly focused on lending visibility to lesser televised sports here in Scotland, like cricket and swimming. They built a strong brand and in 2019, as well as continuing to lend a voice to those sports that don't get big screen coverage, QTV won the contract for the Scottish Premier Football League highlights. Football is a mainstream sport and as it is frequently shown on television, demands broadcast quality coverage. So that meant QTV developing more extensively into the field of outside broadcasting. But what is that, you might ask? There's no doubt you have at some point watched the coverage of a live event from your comfort of your own home. Whether it's a local sports match, a music festival or the Olympics, you will almost definitely have watched and listened to the end product of an outside broadcast. OBs are big, complicated and a very expensive process. They involve a large number of people that have to travel to the event. Lots of technical equipment and custom built trucks and lots of planning so that the pictures and or sound can be transmitted to you at home. Let's talk about how that is traditionally achieved. So outside broadcasts, or OBs, beginning with radio then moving into television, began back in the 1920s, but the very first big OB was the coronation of George VI in 1937. As this was a hugely historic and exciting event, most of the public wanted to be able to see and hear it. Rather than having just one camera showing everything from the same angle, and one microphone to cover that huge abbey, the BBC used a total of three cameras. That was half of the total number they owned at that time and 28 microphones. The viewership for this was around 10,000. At that time, this was considered very large scale coverage and very few people owned or could afford a television set at that time. The information received by each of the cameras and microphones had to be brought back to one location with a production gallery, much like the ones used in television studios, enabling the director and vision mixer to cut around several different angles, allowing the people at home to see more of what was going on and the sound mixer created a sound space to match the pictures. However, unlike a studio, the distance the cameras and the microphones had to travel was much greater. And sending signals over copper cables comes with limitations on distance in order to mitigate signal loss or attenuation. One of the major causes of attenuation in cables is noise. This noise can come from many sources, nearby power cables, radio or electric currents, and even poorly terminated cables. 
Attenuation becomes more of a problem as the cable gets longer, so to keep these runs as short as possible, the BBC deployed their very first outside broadcast vehicle, MCR1, short for Mobile Control Room 1. This OB truck worked as a mobile production gallery with onboard vision mixer, sound mixer and camera control units. This vehicle could be driven straight to the venue, allowing cameras and microphones to be used with the shortest cable runs possible. Over the years, technology improved and the number of cameras and microphones used for large-scale coverage has increased significantly. For the World Cup happening right now, each match has 42 cameras, including specialist wireless cameras, spider cam, jibs, back cam, drones, pole and net cams. In terms of sound coverage, there are 32 microphones placed in every conceivable crevice of the pitch, high effects as well as omnidirectional microphones. The complexity of the coverage is such that they utilise mix automation software called Lawo Kick. This makes use of GPS information transmitted from packs worn by players to locate the movement of the ball around the pitch. This information helps to automatically balance the correct mic microphones and maintain tight audio coverage of play. They deliver a basic stereo mix as well as Dolby Atmos mix. VAR is present and also makes use of GPS information for player tracking technology. On top of all of that, there's a huge pool of broadcasters from all over the world at International Broadcast Centre adding in their own presentation and analysis. The expected viewing figures for the final are more than 1.5 billion people in 42 countries, and so no expense is spared. The way in which large-scale coverage like Royal Events or the World Cup always means an extremely large budget. But what about smaller events? The organisers of these will often be working with extremely small budgets and regularly have to scale back what they are able to afford. But the way in which we cover these smaller events and what we can offer is rapidly evolving for many reasons, financial as well as environmental. One of the biggest factors that influences both of these is the cost and fuel impact of, of sending large crews with heavy vans of equipment to distant locations. This has led to a long-running exploration of how to cover events remotely. But what does that mean? The title may be a little misleading, as it suggests that everything can be done from another location, but that is not true. You still need an OB van with camera and sound equipment at the location, and a crew to operate as the source material still needs to be captured, but the size and scale of the OB can be dramatically reduced. This seems like a good point to present the core ingredient of this lecture, the idea of multiplexing. Multiplexing dates all the way back to Thomas Edison in 1874. Edison devised a way to send two individual messages on one path of a telegram system. In modern terms, and the way in which we want to discuss it for this lecture, we should consider multiplexing as a means for multiple channels to be bundled together and sent simultaneously in one single stream of data. Multiplexing is dependent on bandwidth. The ban more bandwidth you have, the more data you can squeeze into a single path. One of the most common forms of multiplexing in broadcast is embedding of audio into video signals, commonly referred to as embedded audio. The evolution from analogue to digital signal distribution in television back in the early 2000s brought about a number of significant changes. One of the biggest was in how we handle audio. About 20 years ago, when I began in broadcasting, big broadcasters like the BBC would include several layers of audio routing often a mix of analogue and digital, as well as a separate layer of video routing. But with the introduction of standardised audio embedding, that is the mapping of AES audio and control data within the frame of a single SDI video, introduced by the Society of Media Professionals, Technologists and Engineers, or SIMPTI, we are now able to use just one cable to carry both vision and audio along one path. Without getting too bogged down in the technicalities, imagine a frame around the picture you currently see on the television. That frame is made up of an ancillary space in which we can encode other useful data. Using modern day routing systems, that single video signal along with its 16 associated channels of audio can be broken out and shuffled around to create different stereo mixes. This allows takers or clients to be sent component parts of a mix so they can create their own personal mix. For example, on one video output feed from an OB, we could send clean effects or international sound Slightly different in subject matter for a whole other lecture on audio channels 1 and 2, AES pair 1. We could also send a full programme mix with effects and English language commentary on audio channels 3 and 4, 
or EASP pair 2. This allows some takers to be able to use our full mix or for other takers to be able to take the clean effects and put their own commentators over the top of it, perhaps in a different language. We could also send them any separate music tracks on channels 5 and 6 so that they could use that in their own mix or potentially many more isolated feeds of other microphones or sources. Basically, anything a taker requests can be separated and sent on different channels for them to use as they see fit. It broadens the flexibility for post-production as well as for live productions being sent to so many different clients. There is, however, a very obvious risk factor in using this tool. By tying so much of your audio routing to your vision routing, should something go wrong and you lose a vision path, you will also lose some of your audio, which can be far from ideal. This can be mitigated by carefully considering which paths you embed your audio to. For example, sending a left gantry mic down one camera and the right gantry mic down another. But there will still always be a chance that you will potentially lose something. So it becomes a question of weighing up resilience against risk. How often is there a failure? And are we, as the facility provider, confident the risk is low? By reducing traditional broadcast resilience and relying on new technologies, you may be able to afford something else or to simply keep the budget to a minimum. This might not seem like a risk that a large scale expensive broadcaster might want to take, but for a small client with a limited budget, it can make the difference between being able to afford your OB or not. With the option of embedded audio now readily available to us, allowing us to send so many audio signals successfully over fewer transmission lines, combined with the widespread rollout of high speed fiber optics, which all but eliminates the long standing problem of latency or delay in these signals, the door to remote OB productions has been left wide open. Let's now take you on a journey as we follow the long and complex routes that an audio signal can take as it travels from the heart of the action at a live event through our remote production facilities here at QTV and to the ears of you, the viewer, watching at home or listening at home. We currently have one of our remote vans, Eng1, out at Rugby Park, the home of Scottish Premiership team Kilmarnock Football Club. For the SPFL, we provide six camera coverage Two cameras on the gantry, a high platform on one of the stands, one of which gives a high wide shot and the other a tight shot. One camera low behind the goalposts, one camera high behind the opposite goalpost and two cameras on the two 18 yard lines. Each camera has one operator. Our OB van sits just outside the stadium, parked beside two very important cabinets. One has all of the connections to each camera position and contains long hybrid fibre cables. Hybrid fibre is designed to carry power, audio, video and data and are another example of signal multiplexing. This cabinet also has tie lines for single mode fibre. This allows us to distribute all kinds of signals into the stadium, audio, video, data, depending on which pieces of kit we put on the other end. We can multiplex all of those things down to one or two cables. The second cabinet is the all-important BT Media and Broadcast Cabinet. There are lots of different types of connections in here, all running through British Telecom's fast and extensive software-defined network. Behind the front panel are dedicated encoders and decoders to convert video into MPEG and compressed signals that can be transmitted. There are also data ports that allow separate VLAN connections back to remote production control rooms across their fibre network. Our OB van sits in between these two important cabinets. Working in the van are two hardy engineers. They are responsible for looking after all the signal paths running between the cameras and audio sources within the stadiums, which are embedded and then de-embedded within the van and the control room back here at base. Back here at QTV's headquarters, this is our production control room guarantee desk. This, looks after, this is looked after by a technical manager, often looking after several matches at once. Our job is to communicate with the end fans out there in the field, coordinate and technically check all of the incoming feeds, fade up the currently required audio feed and make sure that everything is distributed appropriately to the correct PCR, or production control room. For each match, we have the director, the person in charge of the production, who calls the shots and cuts around the sources, and the replay operator, who records all of the action and runs any VTs or slow motion replays the director might like to see. The director is the person in charge of the final output of the broadcast. This is the single output, the culmination of those separate feeds coming in from the stadium. And it's sent through to our master control room, MCR. It's a very technical 
busy hub where many feeds are taken in and out and sent to various clients and partners around the world, including broadcasters like BBC, Sky, ITV, CBS and Sony, among others, to streaming networks like YouTube and Facebook through the use of our world feed and flex stations. It's through these channels that you, the viewer, are now able to watch the output. So, now that you know the output path, let's take a closer look at the technical side of how a remote production is put together, with particular focus on the audio paths. It begins with the Eng van arriving on site. The six camera operators will rig the camera positions, whilst the two engineers interconnect the van with the fibre cabinet and the BT cabinet. As well as the isolated camera feeds with their embedded audio, there is also one other vital cable, a single CAT6 that will carry all of our communication and camera tally data. Establishing communications, or comms, is crucial. It's vital that the crew back at base are able to communicate with the crew at the OB, allowing us to work efficiently and coordinate together. For us, this is achieved utilising super low latency, that is very little delay, layer two tunnel connections. Layer 2 is a point-to-point -point connection over a wide area network, as opposed to passing through multiple exchanges. Our signals go directly from Kilmarnock to here without going via Bali or Los Angeles. This allows many matrix intercom panels, like this one, to communicate with each other seamlessly and instantaneously, whether they're located in another room within this building, out at a local football ground, or anywhere else in the world. For our remote OBs, we need to establish several lines of communication between the engineers and ca camera operators at the OB, the director and replay operator back at the PCR, and the technical guarantee in the middle, trying to bring them all together. It's important these communication lines are separate, otherwise everybody starts talking over the top of each other. So to recap the setup, we have our director and replay operator in the PCR here in Glasgow, and our camera operators and engineers currently 30 miles away parked just outside the stadium in Kilmarnock. Our first step is to establish comms with our engineers in Eng1. This is Julie in PCR checking talkback to Conrad in Eng1. This is Julie in PCR checking talkback to Conrad in Eng1. Hi, this is Conrad in Eng1. Here you are clear. Once that's been established, we can then make contact with the camera operators in the field who are today working in minus nine degrees and who will need to be able to communicate with the director back at the PCR. This is QTV calling out to Stephen on camera two at Kilmarnock. Oh. Oh. Try again. This is QTV calling out to Stephen at Kilmarnock. So now the cameras are all rigged and we've established comms to the OB. What about actually capturing the sound for the broadcast? Well, up in the gantry, as well as rigging the two cameras, the operators will also rig two Sennheiser 416 microphones, one covering the left-hand side of the pitch and one covering the right-hand side of the pitch. These will be our effects mics, providing a general soundscape of the crowd and the action on the field. On a much bigger OB, there would be many more effects mics rigged all around the pitch, including behind the goals. These would be mixed by the, in the van by a sound supervisor. It's not possible to have all mics faded up all of the time because of echoes from ball kicks and crowd noise. So as the play moves around the field, the supervisor manually fades up the corresponding microphones around the pitch. Though as mentioned earlier, technology does exist which automates this process. For a live broadcast, rigging more mics and manually mixing them like this definitely provides a much clearer and more pleasing sound. You can clearly hear every kick of the ball, as well as every shout of the players on the field. If you were listening to a live match through surround sound, you would definitely be disappointed with only two effects mics. However, as our contract for coverage is simply to record the match for broadcaster highlights, and there will often be commentary teams or analysts talking over the top of it, we find that it is acceptable to only have two effects mics. This also pleases the client as it keeps the budget to a minimum. To get the signal from our two effects mics back to us here at base, we embed them within a camera channel. It's quite a simple and effective process. Let's throw to Stephen, our camera operator up in the gantry at Kilmarnock, who can tell us more about the setup. Gareth in PCR QTV. Stephen, could you tell us a bit more about your setup? Yes, of course. Hello, I'm Stephen Wilcox, Operations Manager and Camera Guarantee at QTV Sports. 
On a match day, I normally operate camera two, which is located up in the gantry next to camera one. Once I have my camera set up and ready to go, that's when I move on to the audio setup. The audio we use, uh, we use two effects mics which are attached to a secure surface in the gantry using magic arms. We then connect the mics into the camera using an XLR cable. The setup we use, we have two mics. The left hand mic goes into camera one, channel one, and the right hand mic goes into camera two, channel one. So you attach the XLR into the back of the camera. Once that's attached, the audio is embedded onto the pictures, which travels down the hybrid uh, fibre cable all the way back to the van. The engineers back at the van have to make sure that the correct hybrid fibre cable is plugged into the correct camera base station, or CCU. That way, through this base station, they have a crude but effective level control that can be adjusted to make sure the incoming level is not too high. An SDI video feed with embedded audio is then taken out of the base station and fed into the BT cabinet. Here, the video signals are typically compressed using J2K to 110 megabits per second per channel. AES audio pairs can be limited to minimize bandwidth use, but that said, audio uses very little bandwidth compared to video. The signals travel through BT's media and broadcast network and arrive back here at QTV. The feed from every camera is plugged into our matrix, or router, the heart of any broadcast system. We use a very particular router that allows us to take each input feed and break it down into its component parts. Video, represented by the red piece of pie here, and its eight separate audio channels shown in many different colours as you can see. Using this router, we can send any individual audio or video component to any destination within our system. Here, on our PCR Guarantee multi-viewer screen, we have the full signal from each camera, including its associated embedded audio. And you can see audio meters for each of them up here. This gives us a visual representation of the signal present on each audio channel placed on top of the associated video signal. It's a great way to be able to see everything coming in to us. It's worth mentioning that we are dealing with a couple of different audio formats in this workflow. We mentioned AES earlier, but we also use MADI and DANTI. Multi-channel audio digital interface, or MADI, also known as AES-10, is a means of encoding or multiplexing 64 channels of audio into one cable. We also use DANTI, an audio over IP network protocol, allowing the transfer of signals in any direction across a dedicated network. Our sound mixing desk, as well as analog audio inputs, also has a MADI card. As mentioned, Dante and MADI are two different formats of digital audio. They're not directly compatible, but using a very clever converter, we can get them to talk to each other. Through this converter, we can send 64 channels of digital audio from our main router, which is already taking in the camera feeds with their embedded audio into our mixing desk. This means that we can send Camera One's audio channel to this first fader here. And Camera Two's audio channel one to this fader here. If I fade them both up, we're now, both, we're now listening to the output of those two mics on the gantry at Kilmarnock. We can't just take that as read, however. As engineers, we want to be sure that we're listening to the correct signal path. So we have to identify the mics with Stephen, making use of our comms system again. Julie to Stephen, can you ident the left mic for us, please? Yes. As Stephen claps next to the left mic, we can see it using this visual representation on the multiviewer, but more importantly, we can hear it through the sound mixer, which has its own internal audio meters. This process doesn't allow for us to set the levels of the fader, but it does work as a crude test to make sure that we're hearing what we expect to in the right place. That's great, Stephen, thank you. Can you now ident the right hand mic for us, please? Of course. Now we can listen to the second fader and identify the second gantry microphone. That's great, Stephen. Thank you. I have both of those. One of the other feeds that we need for our contracted coverage is the live commentators who will be present during the game. This uses a very similar process. Stephen, can you talk us through your commentary setup, please? Of course. So after we have set up the effects mics, we move on to the commentary. 
Now, the commentary units are normally provided by the clubs. We set it up in an area that they can see the pitch. The output is then taken through an XLR cable back up to the cameras. We usually have the home commentary going into camera one, channel two, and the away commentary goes into camera two, channel two. And again, it's connected through our XLR. Once we've connected it all, that's when we want to do a test and we want to make sure that the truck is hearing the commentators okay. Test, test, test. Kilmarnock commentary test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Test, test, test. Kilmarnock Again, back here at base, test. we have a visual representation one, two, three, of that incoming four, five, audio six, feed seven. down camera one, channel two, on our multiviewer. And when I fade it up here, we should be able to hear Stephen's audio check. That's great, thank you Stephen, loud and clear. The home and away commentaries are not sent to everybody. They're usually only required by the local clubs, so they're separated in our router and only sent to those who need it. Most of our takers just want the simple straightforward mix with clean effects. Another part of our coverage is to provide post-match post interviews, <laughs> which we cover on camera three. We have the reporter's mic and the interviews mic sent down its two audio channels. Every camera in the stadium can carry two channels of analog audio, limited by the number of XLR ports on the camera itself. We're covering our matches using only two FX mics on the gantry, but the scope is there to have more, two at every camera if the client requires it. Once we've checked all of our incoming mics, our very simple sound mix comprising of two effect mics, two interview mics and the replay output, none of which are required at the same time, is done by our sound guarantee sitting here at the PCR guarantee desk. The output of that sound mix for each individual match is then embedded onto the vision feed of its associated PCR. This desk is currently set up to handle four simultaneous outputs. So the sound mix for each match from here is embedded onto the vision mix created by the directors in there. This brings everything together as one single vision feed with a stereo embedded audio mix. The single feed for each match is then sent through to our MCR, the central hub, where it can potentially have more audio feeds embedded onto it before it's distributed to any clients or takers who've requested it. This can be done in a few different ways, by sending it back out to BT Tower through an IP delivery solution or even live streamed over the internet. So that's quite the journey to make. Let's sum up the audio paths that we've demonstrated here today. Analog microphone signals at the OB are digitized and embedded onto a camera's video signal. This is sent through BT's fiber network, then converted into MADI within our router. This audio signal is then converted to Dante for use in our sound mixing desk. The sound mixer's output is then converted back into MADI so that it can be routed within our router onto the video output from our production control room. This single embedded SDI feed is then sent by our MCR via fiber or IP to broadcasters like the BBC who then deliver it over cable, satellite or streaming to your very analogue ears listening at home. Like every journey, it takes time. So let's briefly talk about a very important factor, latency. This is the delay that can be introduced when a signal is converted. As Julie just described, our mic signals are being converted several times from start to finish. The latency introduced in analogue to digital conversion within the camera is around one millisecond. The latency introduced in the conversion between digital formats like MADI and Dante are less than a millisecond. For all intents and purposes, this delay is negligible. The biggest jump is the trip from site to base, which takes approximately 20 milliseconds. Latency builds up, so we need to be very careful and check that the audio is in sync with the vision, occasionally having to compensate with it with delay. One of the benefits of relying on embedded audio, however, is that both vision and audio are intrinsically linked for the journey. That said, it's always good practice to check sync, so we would use a clapperboard test to ensure sound and pictures match up. More advanced OBs will utilize valid video and audio sync check reader, or Hitomi Clearglass to measure latency accur accurately. So that was a very quick overview of how our remote OB productions work. This approach is not used exclusively for football, however. We also use it for single, co single camera coverage of netball and jump rope, or four camera coverage of rugby, often making use of mobile viewpoint and live view technology. These signals, these send signals back to base over SIM cards and or Wi-Fi and wired internet, 
allowing you to set a priority so that one of those routes goes down, you still have another one to rely on. We have also used similar approaches for corporate events taking augmented PA feeds in through the cameras and are currently looking at ways to use these methods to cover comedy and music events too. The model is completely scalable, from single camera coverage to as large an event as the client is willing to pay for. Now that you know how it works, let's have a look at the advantages of remote outside broadcast model. Most notably, the physical labour and time involved in rigging can be significantly reduced. Likewise, the smaller amount of equipment being carried allows for more lightweight vehicles. When we spoke about multiplexing, I mentioned that the more bandwidth you have, the more signals you can accommodate in a single path. For example, take a look at this audio multi-cable. It can carry eight cores of audio and for a 100 metre costs about 900 pounds. 100 metres of this cable also weighs about 46 kilos, including the drum it ca that carries it. There are 24 individual cores running through this cable, making it incredibly heavy. However, if you lose one of those cores, you still have seven feeds coming through. Uh, this is a video cable. Now we've talked a lot about embedding video and audio. So down this cable, you have one video feed and 16 channels of audio, as we've discussed. And this can run up to 100 meters before reaching digital cliff and losing signal. 100 meters of this type of cable weighs about five kilos. We then have a CAT6 cable. A CAT6 cable can support a one gigabit connection. It can carry 512 bi-directional channels of Dante audio up to 100 meters and would cost about 60 pounds and weighs about a kilo. And moving on from that, we have an eight core single mode fiber cable. It's a little heavier than the CAT6, but this cable can carry 2,048 channels of audio over a distance of up to 40 kilometers. That's a lot more audio channels over a long, longer distance and at a fraction of a cost. It's also worth mentioning that this same cable is capable of sending multiple video feeds, data networks, camera feeds, as well as audio using a different type of multiplexing. This is known as wavelength division multiplexing and uses different frequencies of light to send the different signals. All of these factors add up. Less people and heavy equipment travelling in enormous vehicles amounts to a smaller budget and a reduced carbon footprint. By using more lightweight vehicles, we also allow outside broadcasts to be covered in much smaller venues. This opens up the market, allowing smaller companies to be competitive and to be able to compete, and less affluent clients to consider broadcasting as a f an affordable option. We have tried to level the playing field, pardon the pun, so we, <laughs> we can produce high quality content on a smaller budget. This is a new area and by adopting the fundamental approach of broadcasting an aspiration for excellence, but scaling it back to accept the limitations of budget and the risk that comes without resilience, we've helped to capture new audiences and clients who in turn can build on new avenues of commercialization. This helps to build the industry and hopefully over time increases production budgets. This ecology feeds back into the industry and allows us to train more people as the demand increases. Speaking of the future, let's take a look at some new and exciting technologies that are set to influence the outside broadcast world in the next few years. As our Chief Technology Officer, I must warn you that Gareth can get a little carried away at the prospect of new toys, so this may get a bit, little bit jargony. Please bear with us. Yes, there's some exciting uh, developments being explored in broadcast technology right now, so I beg your patience. Cloud-based technology is certainly the immediate future for broadcasting and Grass Valley are currently pioneering with their agile media processing platform, AMP. So what do we mean by cloud-based technology? Well, first of all, it's important to understand that the cost of broadcast equipment is enormous. There's a huge outlay for cameras, vision mixers, audio mixers, video routers, replay systems. My shopping list is endless, much to the distress of the head of finance. AMP allows users to connect physical control surfaces at their premises with remote server-based applications such as vision mixers, replay systems, talkback and audio desks. Working on a license-based functionality gives the user's ability to spin up additional services in the cloud at a moment's notice and have that functionality immediately, only paying for it when it's required. This technology gives the resilience of being server-based and removes the chance that a card might fail in your matrix 
where you might lose a fader channel in your audio disc. It also allows you to access these sources from anywhere in the world. In a nutshell, this means that it's possible to have your director in Glasgow, your replay operator in Mexico, sound supervisor in Iceland, and producers in LA, and your vital prompt operator right here with you always. All working in the same virtual studio environment, looking at the same multi-viewers on a virtual talkback system. Your crew are all over the world, but your studio is in the cloud. As connectivity continues to improve, the possibilities for cloud-based production become more and more appealing, affording workers the luxury of having more convenient working practices and reducing their need to travel, not only locally, but globally. Much like our remote productions, but even more so, the use of server-based services also has the benefit of reducing the energy requirement by reducing the weight and cabling and equipment in trucks, which in turn reduces the size of vehicles needed, which again reduces the carbon footprint of the OB. We need the industry to embrace these technologies to help carve a sustainable path for the future of broadcasting. This photograph shows the 2017 Champions League final. There are more than 60 vehicles here, generators, articulated lorries, some of which are many years old and have had to travel a long way to get there. The cost of constantly moving with technology is hugely prohibitive, even to the most successful of companies. Vehicles stay on the road until the wheels literally fall off, and I have seen that happen. Imagine how many vehicles could be removed from that picture if we adopt this new type of technology. Touching more specifically on audio, there are exciting developments with the integration of artificial intelligence for audio mixing in sport. As mentioned earlier, a traditional sound mix is done by the supervisor manually riding microphones around the area where play is taking place. We also touched on Lao Kick and the automation of audio mix using GPS data from players and the ball. This requires a huge amount of concentration. It means that if, if there is a problem, you cannot leave your position to deal with it without adversely affecting the output. This can be a difficult topic, sparking heated debate. As people who have both spent over 20 years each in the broadcasting industry, we know that nothing can ever fully replace the skill and expertise of a trained and experienced professional. That human touch or sight or listen will always be required, but it can be exciting to consider these new tools being explored that can assist broadcasting professionals with improved workflows. Indeed, the AI technology used by companies like Salsa Sound can do, do just that. They attempt to simplify the audio mix process for sporting events by considering microphones as a sensor in a three-dimensional space. An artificial intelligence engine can automatically mix a soundstage using audio templates, looking for on-pitch events like referee's whistle, ball kicks or contact with the goal and considering them as objects. Huge libraries of the sounds heard at sporting events have been fed into the AI engines, allowing it to learn and associate audio with specific occurrences in the field of play. After digesting thousands of hours of footage, it understands the difference between a drum being hit and a football being kicked. This allows the engine to create audio profiles which can be applied to the mix. By analysing time differences between the microphones receiving signals that match the specific audio profiles of these objects, allows the engine to determine exactly where and when on the pitch the event took place. When an audio event occurs that is recognised from a defined profile, the AI engine rapidly calculates the sound position, then applies appropriate equalisation and shaping, determined by the profile of the sound to enhance the specific object. Excitingly though, it is also recording all of the information associated with that specific event and creating metadata, a way of associating lots of extra information with a file, like time, date, format, etc., but also much more specific information, like the XY coordinates of the audio event or the type of sound that it is. As is often the case with metadata, doors to other dimensions begin to open up. Although there is already AI technology for cameras which utilise ball follow technology, it's easy to see how additional metadata could be used to help finesse these systems. If the audio can triangulate to an area in a three-dimensional space, it seems reasonable to think that that information could be used to get a camera to follow the movement of play, to identify which camera could be used for a replay, and possibly even queue up the exact point for the replay. It's exciting to imagine that as this technology is applied and evolves and the metadata becomes increasingly granular, it will create more and more applications for further intelligent automation of broadcast. That was a lot of information. <laughs> I told you it could get carried away. However, as fans of Inverness Cali Thistle Football Club will attest, there are inherent flaws to trusting AI to determine the movement of a game. Fans of the club became quite frustrated 
after an AI camera programmed to follow the round white object on the field began following the referee's follicularly, follicularly challenged head rather than the ball. These are challenges that will be overcome in the fullness of time, but it is exciting to consider the possibilities. The final thing we'll touch on today is the emerging use of 5G technology in broadcast. Everyone will have heard of 5G, whether it's wild conspiracy theories relating to how COVID was deployed or that it enables you to happily stream Netflix as you walk through the city. As we've moved through this lecture, we've charted the evolution from copper point-to-point -point cables through serial data and the advent of embedded audio to wavelength division multiplexing and audio and video over IP. The next stage of evolution is the move to robust wireless networks. 5G is exciting because it allows super fast high bandwidth wireless connectivity. Roughly 10 times faster than 4G, it allows speeds of up to 10 gigabits. Up until now, wireless technologies and broadcasts have been dominated by radio microwave links. These are expensive, heavy and unidirectional. Radio cameras used for football or rugby coverage have no return talkback, no return pictures, and they also use a separate system for tally and control. 5G promises to enable wireless bi-directional communication with devices, which means that all camera comms, vision paths and control data could exist in the network for multiple devices at the same time. What's even more exciting is that it allows for use stacking. Use stacking is the idea that one system can be utilised for many purposes. Not only could you be running six to eight broadcast cameras on that network, you could also be bringing in wireless microphones and sending out wireless in-ear monitor feeds. It could be bringing in specialist cams like drones and spider cam or sending monitor feeds to big screens. It could be distributing timing information to clocks or it could be bringing in mobile phone cameras from influencers in the crowd, truly altering what is perceived as achievable in modern broadcast. It could be delivering all of this with none of the cables being deployed in the ground and that is what's so exciting. As 5G exists right now for, you, for your phone, it's focused on giving users a high download speed for streaming content. Broadcast requires high upload bandwidth so that lots of data can be sent elsewhere. This means we have to be able to flip the model. Part of the initial excitement for 5G was the idea that broadcasters could slice off parts of the public 5G network to be used for their own means. But as yet, that technology is still in development. What is currently possible is the ability to deploy your own pop-up private 5G network, independent of the public spectrum. Here at QTV, we've been working closely with Neutral Wireless, who have developed the first 5G network in a box. Trials of 5G for cameras have been underway this year on various sporting events, notably BT Sports trial at Saracens Rugby, where Neutral Wireless's network in a box was deployed for touchline cameras. Traditionally, this would have been a radio link camera. QTV recently worked on a promotional event with Neutral Wireless to bring an exclusively 5G-based 4-camera OB from Pitt Lockery in the Scottish Highlands all the way to IBC in Amsterdam as part of the Accelerator programme. Not long after that, when the sudden death of the late Queen put extraordinarily high demand on the broadcast industry, we made the decision to use this technology live at Edinburgh Airport in what we believe to be the world first to capture her, the final departure of Her Majesty from Scottish soil. 5G video, video links were utilised at this event with no backup or failover. It was a standalone source that was being viewed by millions of people live around the world. These new technologies are extraordinarily exciting. They are indeed, but we've taken up quite enough of these good people's time. We hope you've enjoyed this lecture. We especially hope you've learned a thing or two about remote OB productions and what may be possible in the very near future. Be sure to keep across the Audio Engineering Society website, AES, uk.org. We'd like to thank BT and Media Broadcast, Kilmarnock Football Club and of course Audio Engineering Society for inviting us to talk today. Please enjoy the rest of your day and have a very merry festive season. From all of us here at QTV, thanks for joining us.